Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to The Frontline with Joe and Joe. Joe Pasillo, as always, joined by Joe Resinello. And once more, dear brothers and sisters, let us go in to the breach on the Veritas Catholic Radio Network, 1350 on your AM dial, 103.9 on your FM dial, serving the New York City metropolitan area. Please be sure to download the Veritas Catholic Radio Network mobile app so that you could have access to all of our station's content, not just Frontline with Joe and Joe. Um, and if you'd like to give some feedback, VeritasCatholic.com, VeritasCatholic.com. There's a section in there where you could provide some feedback on our show and other shows. We'd greatly appreciate that. And of course, Joe and I are on social media, YouTube. We are primarily the Frontline TV, the Frontline TV. And we also have a website, thefrontlinetv.com, thefrontlinetv.com. So thank you uh, for all your support. And today we're very pleased and honored to be welcoming back a friend of the program, Robert Riley. And we're going to be discussing his book. Uh, now, this is where you go into the breach on some of these things, Joe Resinello. OK, the title of the book is The Closing of the Muslim Mind, How Intellectual Suicide Created the Modern Islamist. Um, and obviously, Rob knows what Robert knows what he's talking about when it comes to these things. That's why he wrote the book. We're going to talk about why that's important, why we should even be talking about this. But very quickly, Robert R. Riley is director of the Westminster Institute. In his 25 years of government service, he served as special assistant to the president and as director of the Voice of America. And he was also senior advisor for information strategy to the secretary. Secretary of Defense, taught National Defense and excuse me, taught at National Defense University. He attended Georgetown and the Claremont Graduate University and has published widely on American politics and morals, foreign policy and classical music. His other books include Making Gay OK, How Rationalizing Homosexual Behavior is Changing Everything, Surprised by Beauty, A Listener's Guide to the Recovery of Modern Music, and of course, the book we're going to be discussing today, The Closing of the Muslim Mind. Robert R. Riley, welcome back, our friends, to the front line with Joe and Joe. Thank you, Joe and Joe. Good to be back with you. Good to have you, sir. Bob, we always begin with a prayer uh, because all good things start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Remember, O oh most gracious Virgin Mary, never was it known that anyone who sought your help or sought your intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, we climb up to you, a virgin of virgins, our mother. To you we come, before you we stand, sinful and sorrowful. O oh mother, the word incarnate, despise not our petitions, but in your clemency hear and answer us. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, Bob, I, I guess a good place to start is like, why? Why did you write this book, The Closing of the Muslim Mind? Um, to be honest with you, I think that'll be a good starting point and it'll branch out into a lot of different uh, avenues of conversation. Yeah, sure. I was um, somewhat professionally associated with the subject because uh, I was working both first at the Voice of America, where our many language services included, of course, broadcasting to quite a few Muslim majority countries. And uh, when I worked at the Department of Defense, it was a professional interest in that I uh, worked in the Office of Policy on uh, the Near East. I also had an intellectual interest in the subject matter, of course, occasioned by 9-11. I recall Osama bin Laden saying that his spiritual mentor, Abdullah Azam, had told him that terrorism is an obligation in Allah's religion. I thought that's very interesting. I think I better study Muslim theology, which I did. Now, the larger historical question is how did this once great civilization, which say in the ninth century Baghdad was absolutely resplendent fall into a state of such decay from which it's really never recovered. I mean, there were temporary recover, uh, recoveries uh, in some of the caliphates and under the Ottomans, but there's also a long range trajectory of decline to the point that today, the Arab Muslim world is at the bottom of every index of human development except for Sub-Saharan Africa. And from I'm quoting now from the UN Human Development, the Arab UN Human Development Reports, written all by Arabs. 
that go through the level of education, uh, GDP, productivity, uh, the number of patents, et cetera, that shows that this part of the world is deeply dysfunctional. So I became very interested as to why. What happened was very clear. Bernard Lewis wrote a very famous book called What Went Wrong. And anyone who has any experience in the Middle East knows more or less what went wrong. But why did it go wrong? Why did this once flourishing civilization enter into such a seemingly fatal decline? So that was the puzzle I set myself. And I spent about 10 years studying the subject. Well, Bob, let me, let me ask you this. We have Bob Riley on the show, Frontline with Joe and Joe. We're talking about his book, The Closing of the Muslim Mind. So now tell me if I have my history off. You had a Persian civilization that uh, valued philosophy, okay, uh, had an open mind, uh, subsequently conquered by an Arab civilization that during the time of the Arab, Arab Muslim conquest. Now, am I wrong about that? Well, I'm glad you, you raised that point because it, 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 uh, I should make this distinction right at the beginning. My book, The Closing of the Muslim Mind, does not mean all Muslim minds have closed. Uh, it, it explicitly does not include Shia Islam, which is what the Persians are. They are the Shia uh, Muslims. It is mainly about Sunni Islam. And within Sunni Islam, it's about the majority theological school called Asherism. Mm -hmm. So the Sunnis are the majority, say 85 or a higher percent of all Muslims are Sunni. Within that 85%, a majority follow the Asherite theological school. That's what I focus on. That's what I try to demonstrate led to this closing of the Muslim mind. When was it open, though? By I think that's where I was going with it. So you're 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 talking about, let's say, um, a, a Persian civilization, uh, philosoph you know, like we said, valued philosophy. Heck, if I have my again, if I have my history correct, we have Aristotle because of the Muslims. I guess my larger question is, when was the Muslim mind open historically? Right. Okay, but first of all, just to get the the history straight here, um, the. The, the, the Persians were never conquered by the Arabs. Okay. Yeah, so they had their separate Shia caliphate and the Arabs had their caliphate. Now, the Arab mind was opened, let us say, by its encounter with uh, the Byzantine civilization, which it conquered large parts of in the seventh and eighth centuries. And North Africa, the Middle East, Anatolia, these were largely Christian parts of the world. And those parts of the world had been deeply Hellenized. That is, they had been exposed to Greek philosophy. And it wasn't so much that we got Aristotle from the Arabs, the Arabs got Aristotle from the Byzantines. They sent to the court in Constantinople uh, requesting uh, the original Greek, which uh, the emperors then sent to the caliphs who had them translated into Arabic. But here's the story. Now, when, when this desert people enjoyed these extraordinary conquests and they come across these centers of civilization that are in every respect superior to these desert communities from which they came, except militarily, um, they had to, how are we going to regard these people whom we now are ruling? Uh, th their first um, inclination was we'll segregate ourselves from them. We don't wanna be contaminated by these Christians. So we'll live outside the cities. Eventually th that changed and they began living in the cities. And in order to justify their own faith, they had to come up with a source of apologetics just as Christians have their apologetics. And they began mimicking the Christian apologetics, which were deeply influenced by Greek philosophy. So we see the first school, theological school in Sunni Islam is called the Mutazilite school. And this was a rational school of theology 
that was deeply influenced by Greek philosophy that to give you its distinctive character, let me say it stated that the first obligation of man was not to submit. That's what we would be tempted to say. Your first obligation is to submit to Allah. No, the Matazalite said the first obligation of man is to reason. It's to reason. Why? Because the existence of God is not self-evident. So the first thing one ought to do is think about whether God does exist. And if he does exist, how could we come to know him? And why is it that there seems to be an order in nature that our minds can apprehend? And the Mutazalite said, well, it, we, we, we seem to be endowed with this gift of reason through which we can apprehend this order in nature, which itself is rational, which leads us to conclude that the creator God of the world is himself reason or reasonable. You see what I mean? Sure. All of that sounds familiar to you, and it should, because it's the result of the same influences to which Christianity was subject when it came up with its philosophy and theology. So what you're really, Bob, talking about then is logos. So you know, through, through the Greeks, let's say, maybe you, but when you talk about reason, rationality, then we're talking about the order of the universe. We're talking about logos. Yes. You are, that God himself is reason, and that man through his reason can come to know not only the order of creation, but through it, uh, what is right and what is wrong. Man can apprehend what is morally good and what is evil, what is just, as distinct from what is unjust. And because man is endowed with free will, he has an obligation to do the good and to, to do what is just. And that's not just Muslims who have this obligation. All people have the obligation. Mm -hmm. Why? Because all people are endowed with reason. And all people through their reason can come to know these things. It's, fasc uh, it's fascinating, Bob Riley, who's joining so us this, here. Go ahead. Yeah, so just to make sure. So that, that was the opening of the Muslim mind. And just to give you an example, it, it was flourishing in the first half of the ninth century in Baghdad under the Abbasid Caliph al-Mamun, who was the greatest sponsor of Greek philosophy in the history of Islam. It is said that Aristotle came in a dream to al-Mamun and al-Mamun asked him, what is the good? And Aristotle is said to have responded, it is what is rationally good. And therefore, Al-Mamun embraced this answer, this status of reason, and sponsored the Mutazilite theological school. During his reign, he made free will a state doctrine. I mean, we have the popular impression of Islam that it's kismet. It's, it's, it's deeply uh, imbued with fatalism. Well, it, it's true. It did become fatalistic. But here in the ninth century, at least in the first half of the ninth century, uh, free will was a state doctrine. People were responsible for what they did because they had free will and they could know the difference between right and wrong. So that was it. And Al-Mamun requested the Greek texts from the Byzantine emperor who provided them. And then he had Nestorian Christians in Baghdad in the famous House of Wisdom, the Beit al-Hikmah, translate these texts into Arabic. So that's how that uh, began. And for a while it prospered for the next three caliphs it did, but then the fourth caliph after that, Mutawakil, uh, clamped down on the Mutazilite school, suppressed it, and got behind the second theological school in Islam, which is called Asherism after Al Ashari. We're, get, we're um, going to get into that. We're yeah. going to get into that in a second. Bob Riley's joining us here at the front line with Joe and Joe. I want to hold that thought for a sec, Bob. We want to just do, do a little bit before then. Uh, you're at the front line with Joe and Joe Veritas Catholic Radio Network. Joe Resinello, where are we headed? Well, I mean, you mentioned free will. I mean, that's clearly a Catholic idea. Um, and you're basically going to get into how that changed. I mean, we all know uh, through our history books that 
you know, the faith, the Muslim faith was spread through the sword in many respects. I mean, that is the antithesis of the Catholic uh, way to evangelize. I mean, I guess the first part of the question is, how did that change? And to be honest with you, to me, I mean, you can't force someone to love you, nor can you really force someone to believe in you. I just don't understand how they move forward with that. And frankly, I don't know how it's like it's lasted. Well, Joe, you're touching upon that transformation that took place, uh, beginning with the Caliph Mutawakil when he suppressed the Metazolite school. And what replaced it uh, was the refutation of everything I have so far mentioned. In other words, a denial that reason can come to know the difference between right and wrong. They said man is incapable of knowing the difference between right and wrong. Why? Because his reason is corrupted through self-interest, but more to the point, there's really nothing to be known in this sense. Nothing has a nature. What we experience or observe in the universe are simply discrete events caused directly by the will of all-powerful Allah, who is not only the primary cause of things, he is the only cause of things. There are no secondary causes. There is no, there's not such a thing as gravity that makes the rock fall. Fire doesn't make cotton burn, Allah does. Uh, food does not cause satiety, God does. This, um, this, uh, extraordinary view of God's omnipotence removes the laws of nature to such an extent that they become uh, blasphemous. If you say gravity makes the rock fall, you are committing shirk, blasphemy, because you're associating something with God, and God, nothing is associated with God. God is pure will and power, not reason. He can do anything at any time, the reason why anything maintains its identity uh, from one moment to the next is a complete mystery. Because since nothing has a nature for you, Joe, to continue to resemble a human being or actually be a human being is nothing we could have predicted a moment ago, nor could we foretell that you'll be a human being in the next 10 seconds. It's only a discrete act of God that will... Uh, make that to be so, because what's really happening here is that you are being annihilated and reconstituted by the split second. There really is no continuity between anything that just appears there is. So God directly does everything. You see now, as soon as you assert, assert this uh, theology, uh, you obviate free will. If God does everything directly, you're simply subject to fate. In fact, let me give you a little example of what Al-Ashari says. This, this can make it sort of uh, clear for you. This is one of his examples. Uh, a man picks up a pen and writes. It is, however, God who creates in him the will to write, the power to write, and then the motion of the hand, the motion of the hand to the paper with the pen. Allah then causes the figures to appear on the paper as the pen touches it. In other words, it's not this principle of osmosis where the dry paper draws the fluid out from the tip of the pen and therefore causes the figure to appear on the paper. No, that's, that's again causality. We deny mm -hmm. everything but the primary cause. God does everything directly. So that's that's pretty much it and that is the theological source of the closing of the muslim mind and now you wonder where i came up with the title and of course i've been accused of being an islamophobe whereas this this uh, at least the subtitle of the book came from one of the most distinguished muslim intellectuals of the 20th century fazlur rahman who was the first minister of education in Pakistan after it separated from India. 
He was then driven out of the country because the more fundamental Sunni Muslims there didn't like his educational reforms. Here's what Fazl Rahman said, quote, a people that deprives itself of philosophy necessarily exposes itself to starvation in terms of fresh ideas. In fact, it commits intellectual suicide, unquote. Mm. So there you have the death of philosophy. By the way, Joe, you mentioned earlier, how is it that uh, conquest, excuse me, through conquest, Islam spreads the faith. This, of course, was uh, subject to a famous disputation between the Byzantine emperor, Manuel II Paleologos, and his Ottoman captor. Uh, Benedict XVI mentioned this dialogue in his famous Regensburg lecture. And if you recall, it caused a huge uproar in the Islamic world. Here's what he quoted the emperor as saying, spreading for the faith, okay, wait a minute here. The emperor uh, said that spreading faith by the sword is not in accordance with right reason and that, and I'm quoting him, not acting reasonably is contrary to God's nature. Not acting reasonably is contrary to God's nature. Mm -hmm. There you have, Joe, you mentioned logos. Logos, of course, is the Greek word for, well, reason. So you can't act contrary to reason uh, when God himself is reason. And as the emperor pointed out to his Ottoman captor, um, you, therefore it's illegitimate to use force in conversion. Now I'm going to give you another example, a stark contrast between these two theological schools and why the victory of the one over the other has led to catastrophic consequences in the Muslim world. This is refreshing in a way when you can see what was possible at one point within the Muslim world. And this is from a Mutazilite theologian, Abdul Jabbar. Quote, it is obligatory for you to carry out what accords with reason. Unquote. Benedict XVI could have said that, right? Now, let's go to an Asherite theologian. Quote, there is nothing obligatory by reason for the servant of God, unquote. Nothing is obligatory by reason. I mean, you see these are the absolute opposites of each other. And then the most famous Asherite theologian, Al-Ghazali, in the late 11th century wrote, no obligations flow from reason, but from Sharia. So then basically what you're saying is that it's the it's the concept of God, either concept of the concept of God as as reason or let's just say logos, which is reason, amongst other things, or the concept of God as pure will. Correct. That is that's the, what you're saying in this closing of the mind is that what we have is a movement, 85 percent of the Muslim world, as you said, um, that looks at God as a God of pure will, not as a God of love, not as a God of reason not as a God of rationality, a God of pure will. Is that correct? Yes, it is. All right, and we're going to leave uh, it there for one second. Uh, one second, Bob, um, because that's what we're going to explore. Why does that lead? Joe, I know Joe wants to get into. Why does that lead to arrested development in science and philosophy in the whole nine yards? But very quickly, the book that Robert R. Riley uh, has written is The Closing of the Muslim Mind, How, Intelle How Intellectual Suicide Created the Modern Islamist. And he's joining us here. Uh, crisis. Actually, Islamist crisis. Islamist crisis, excuse me. I Sorry, Bob, I left out a word. Joe Racinello, go ahead. I want to get like, ultimately, though, a big difference. Now, they recognize Christ as a prophet. They recognize the Blessed Mother as also they revere her, Miriam. But I think the crux of the problem, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is God would never submit himself to such a death. Is that their issue with Christ where, you know, they leave him as a prophet, 
God would never do that. Yeah, well, you have to uh, understand that Islam is, uh, first of all, if it's anything, it's a denial of the incarnation and it's a denial of the Trinity. Almost every expression of Islamic doctrine contains within it a code word that indicates that uh, Christ was not God and that there is no such thing as a trinity. Um, the, the oldest inscription in uh, Islam is on the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. And around the base of the dome are various uh, Arabic inscriptions uh, that again contain I, I have no partner, I have no associate, uh, all of which means there is no Trinity. You know, I am one, uh, do not say three. Throughout the Quran, Jesus's repeated appearances are almost always accompanied by the fact that he says, I never said I was your son. I would never say anything like that, you see. So, um, the, the, now, the other thing I want to just loop back to here for a second in, in the Ashrite theology, Joe, is since we've established that uh, the primary constituent of reality is God's will and power, not his reason, and things have no nature, they're just the immediate product of his will, that man cannot know the difference between right and wrong. So how is he supposed to know the difference? Only through revelation. The Quran does not reveal what is right and what is wrong. It constitutes what is right and what is wrong. Nothing is right or wrong in and of itself, but only that Allah should say it is so. So in other words, is murder evil? Uh, does God forbid murder because it's evil? Or is it evil because he forbids it? The answer of the Mutazilites was that he forbids it because it's evil. The answer of the Asherites is that it's evil because he forbids it. And he could, and he could change his mind and require you to engage in ritual murder and you'd have to do it, you see. It seems to me it's a lack of authority. I mean, you know, like ultimately, because I mean, we could look at our faith. We have the Pope and the Pope is the authority. He's the vicar of Christ on earth. He unifies the church. That's one of the prime functions of the Pope. There is no authority here. I mean, you're talking about like night and day, like statements that are just like, you know, black or white. There's nobody to say this is what it is. And I think that lies at the, the root of the problem here. Well, no, you've got you, you, you do have, um, first of all, the sources of authority in Islam are the Quran and then the Hadith. And then you have these theological schools through which to try to understand these things. And um, now it's not as if the Mutazilites lost the argument. It's that they were suppressed forcibly. Just as, by the way, the, the Mutazilites were, were uh, forcibly suppressing the early Asherites. I mean, this was a struggle, a life and death struggle. And unfortunately, the side, uh, the side of reason lost, and that accounts for the long uh, decline that we have witnessed in Sunni Islam, and particularly in the Arabic world. Bob, let's leave it there one second. We do have to take a break, okay? Uh, you're listening to Joe Pasillo and Joe Racinello at the front line with Joe and Joe. With Robert Riley, we're discussing his book, The Closing of the Muslim Mind, How Intellectual Suicide Created the Modern Islamist Crisis. We are on the Veritas Catholic Radio Network, 1350, on your AM dial, 103.9 on your FM dial. Please stick around. This is a fascinating conversation. We have another segment with Robert Riley. We'll be right back. Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to The Frontline with Joe and Joe. Joe Pasillo, Joe Rissanello, way, way, way in the breach with Robert R. Riley. We are discussing his book, The Closing of the Muslim Mind, How Intellectual Suicide Created the Modern Islamist Crisis. Joe Rissanello, I'm going to hand it over to you. I want to talk a little bit about what happened during Obama's uh, term as president 
with regard to the Arab Spring, it seemed like we were gaining something there. And then the door slammed shut. Uh, talk a little bit about what happened, where we could have gone, where that could have potentially taken uh, the Muslim world, particularly because of what they were seeing on the Internet. I mean, clearly nowadays there are Internet cafes all over the world, no matter how poor you are, you can see what's going on. Um, and frankly, it seemed like some change was about to happen, but it just didn't go far enough. Yeah, that's the popular view of, of what took place, but I, I don't believe that that's accurate. Um, one Egyptian acquaintance of mine says there, there's no democracy in Egypt because there are no Democrats in Egypt. And he had been one of those who tried to establish a liberal democratic party there unsuccessfully. Now, when you wonder why it is that the Arab Spring did not eventuate into some kind of liberal democratic constitutional order, you have to ask yourself about the fundamental principle behind such constitutional democratic order. And that principle is that all people are created equal. So let's examine Egypt for a moment. Are men and women created equal? No. Are Muslims and non-Muslims created equal? No. Are Jews and Muslims created equal? I mean, you can ask this question throughout the, the Arab world and you'll, you'll generally get the same question. I mean, the same answers, even though some of them have constitutions that seem to provide for this kind of equality in practice, it doesn't exist because the courts don't enforce it and the culture doesn't embrace it. And, and that's why it, you know, it, the Arab Spring ended up reinforcing the power of the Muslim Brotherhood. And the Obama administration promoted and embraced the Muslim Brotherhood which is a, an Islamist movement uh, headed in exactly the opposite direction of what, you would, in, of what you would like to see the Arab world move to. And that's, that was his extraordinary misunderstanding of what uh, forces had been unleashed there and that the principal beneficiary had been the Muslim Brotherhood, which then later, uh, the, the Muslim Brotherhood having overplayed its hand in Egypt was then thrown out of office. And General al-Sisi has reigned ever since. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, look, the, what we've been describing, both theologically and philosophically, helps us to understand why constitutional democratic order never arose indigenously in the Arab Muslim world. But, but also, Bob, let me ask you this, though. Let's say, for argument's sake, they don't value, I'm, I'm just throwing this out there, I don't know, uh, liberal democracy, okay? But it doesn't seem like even if they had a society that operated under some sort of a constitution that limited the power of a monarch of some kind, okay? I don't know if they do or they don't in these various... Muslim nations. But if but if you have no idea or, or, or value for order, OK, in other words, uh, let's say if then 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 basically the power would be arbitrary, according to what how you're describing, you know, Muslim philosophies, if, if the powers are start, whether it comes from Allah or the monarch of some kind, then you're still not going to have order because that power is just going to be wielded arbitrarily. Am I, am I missing something there? Well, no, it's, it's philosophically that would have to be the case because God acts for no reasons. Okay. But by definition, that would have to be arbitrary. And since the caliph is his vice regent on earth, you might, uh, you'd be tempted to say the same of him. On the other hand, there is an order in, in the Muslim world, and it's a religious order. And it's an order provided by the Quran and the Hadith and by the Qadis, by the judges, by the fatwas and the rulings. 
you have to understand that Muslim life is regulated down uh, in, in, to infinitesimal detail. Um, you know, bathroom habits, courtship habits, uh, dietary habits, it's a religion of law. I mean, it was most heavily influenced by Judaism rather than Christianity. And like Judaism, it is a religion of, of laws and of orthopraxy. So they, they have to pray five times a day. They have to uh, go on the Hajj. They have to observe the five pillars. They, it's, it's, it's rather strict and it's highly ordered. And there are, there's really not a lot of latitude there. Of course, there are some secular Muslims who don't pay a lot of attention to it, but um, what order exists, exists according to that. Okay. Let me ask you this. When we had events like 9-11, when you have events uh, that took place in Yemen where four missionary charity sisters were murdered who were helping Muslims, um, You know, there is a law written on the human heart. And what I don't understand is why isn't there a unified voice when an event or or an action takes place that is so overtly wrong? Why isn't there an outcry? Like, are people afraid? Because ultimately, that's, if you ask me, what's going to change the Muslim mind when there is an action like that, that in every situ- in every case, if you're being objective, you would say that cannot be just where you're killing innocent people cannot be just um, even people who are helping your own in the case of the sisters in Yemen. Um, I believe it's the seven year anniversary uh, recently of that event. Why isn't there an outcry? Well, you have a different conception of, uh, of justice, a different conception of what constitutes innocence, and a different set of religious requirements. Uh, you have a completely different conception of who your neighbor is. You know, I wrote another uh, uh, piece, a monograph called the prospects and perils of Catholic Muslim dialogue in which I took a very close look at the attempts to talk across these religions of Catholics with Muslims and Muslims with Catholics and how these misunderstandings get in the way so frequently that although the same words are mentioned, the same things are not meant by them. Uh, Within Islam, you know, Islam contains within itself a profound teaching of equality, which is on display most particularly during the Hajj, when men and women, uh, old, young, living, and even the dead perform this pilgrimage. If someone dies on the Hajj, they just keep carrying the person throughout the various ceremonies. It's, it's uh, of course, a uh, a non-Muslim can't go on the Hajj, but there are films of it and they're really profoundly moving. And I've always asked myself, how is it that Muslims who have such a profound appreciation of their equality with fellow Muslims can't extrapolate that and appreciate the equality of all human beings? And they can't because it's their doctrine not to. But what about the the law that's written on the human heart? I mean, like I could I, I'll tell you, I have like uh, an experience in the Muslim world, Muslim world myself. I've spent a considerable amount of time in Calcutta and the sisters would have mass at 6 a.m. It would be dark and I would be awoken by the call. It's haunting in the middle of the night in deep in the heart of West Bengal. I mean, like it, it to this day. It's like seared into my mind at quarter to six in the morning. Uh, And we would be walking to church in the dark and they're walking to the mosque. We would pass each other like how. I mean, there has there is a common element of humanity there. Well, there can be. Yes. I mean, you of course, they they still are human beings, even though there's no conception of natural law, which is what would teach us. Uh, 
are the fundamental characteristics of a human being, that they're rational, that they are endowed with free will and so forth. We've already discussed this. You know, I had experiences uh, in Iraq with some Muslims uh, who were in Abu Ghraib prison hospital for a year before Saddam Hussein cut off their right hands and scarified their foreheads. And we were given the films of this atrocity being done. And I spent a couple of weeks with these men. I learned a lot from them. One of them gave me the prayer he had written to his wife the night before his hand was lopped off. When a translator tried to read the prayer, she couldn't get through it. She just burst into tears. It was so profoundly moving. Anyway, after two weeks with these men, when I said goodbye to them, I said, I as a Christian salute you as Muslims for the depth of your faith in God. Because I saw in the incredible suffering they have undergone, what that they underwent, the, the thing that sustained them so clearly was their faith in God and that they surrendered to his will and they uh, prayed. I, I was, and by the way, I couldn't have said anything to them that would have pleased them more than the fact that I saluted their faith. By the way, you should know that what repels Muslims are not so much Christians, it, it, what repels them is unbelief. That's what they really despise. They despise atheism, total secularism, um, the worst which Western civilization has to offer itself. Well, let me let me uh, stop you there one second. Robert R. Riley joining us at the front line with Joe and Joe, Joe Pasillo, Joe Rosanello. We're discussing Bob's book, The Closing of the Muslim Mind, How Intellectual Suicide Created the Modern Islamist Crisis. Um, you... Uh, Bob, I'm, I, I apologize. Uh, what, what was what was that that you were just saying again? No, I'm saying that these there there are these kinds of experiences which Joe had referred to um, in India that are that are deeply moving and show that there there is obviously a human connection, even when that connection is is not explicitly recognized. Um, but you you have to say it's it's very. Muslims are not supposed to make non-Muslims friends. They, Islam has a big charitable heart and Muslims are required to give zakat, a charitable contribution every year for widows, orphans, and other good works. However, only Muslims can receive zakat and mm. only they can be the objects of these charitable gifts not non-Muslims, certainly not Christians. Right. Why? Because we believe in a false God, because we, we hold inimical things, that this is not acceptable to them. They're scandalized by it. And um, Muhammad made very clear of what's going to happen to us. I, I remember uh, my question, and then I want to hand, or, or actually, let me just make it a, yeah, let me make it a quick question. Do you, do you blame, and again, I hope this doesn't sound crazy because I'm not trying to act crazy. If I were a Muslim, okay, let's, let me be as charitable as I can. I would reject Western values too. If, uh, cause you mentioned, you know, the West and, and, and the, you know, we're not exactly the paragons of virtue with the things that we, you know, we accept in the West, both in Europe and America. I don't blame Muslims for wanting to reject the West. Now, does that mean should they not, as we're talking about here, uh, get back to a more open philosophical mind and scientific mind and uh, things like that? Yes, I would agree with that. I don't blame the I don't blame the the, the typical Arab for saying, uh, America, what are you offering me? Pornography, abortion? Get, like I wouldn't do it either. I wouldn't buy into it either. I reject Western values in that regard. What am I wrong in that? Well, I think this gets to the heart of what uh, Benedict the Sixteenth was saying in his famous Regensburg lecture. He spoke of the dehellenization of Islam, and that's what we've been talking about for most of this program. First of all, it was Hellenized, then it was dehellenized. But most of what Benedict speaks about in the Re Regensburg lecture 
is the dehellenization of the West. It is we who have turned our backs on reason. It is we who are turning our backs on objective morality. It's we who are turning our backs on morally responsible freedom. And as he makes the point, the only dialogue that you can have is on the basis of reason. And if both sides have dehellenized themselves, well, there, there's no foundation for the dialogue. So the first thing we have to do is basically rehellenize ourselves. And so do the Muslims, and they have a much longer row to hoe than we do. However, we know through cultural relativism, through moral relativism, uh, that we have basically denied the foundations of our own civilization. And that's why we are seeing such widespread corruption, disintegration of the family, mm -hmm. widespread drug use, an ocean of pornography, uh, human trafficking. Mm -hmm. All of this is a logical outcome of our dehellenization. Right. So, I so, wish people... Uh, I wish people would realize that Robert Riley joining us at the front line with Joe and Joe, Joe Pasillo, Joe Racinello. Joe, I'm going to hand it over to you. Are there currently reformers within the Muslim world working to reopen the mind? I mean, clearly there is tolerance. And again, I'll refer to Calcutta, a, a city that is heavily populated by Muslims as well as Hindus. One worships the cow, the other eats it. I mean, I could recall another memory. I'll never forget it. I believe you would know better than I. I think it's the id that they march a, a, a white steer down the street. They were slaughtering animals in the street. They were carcasses. This is in a, in a Hindu country. I mean, how war doesn't break out at the drop of a dime, I don't know. So, I mean, there ha there is some level of tolerance when such actions take place on both sides. Are there reformers like within their their, their world working towards an, an, an opening of that mind? Yeah, there are reformers. In fact, uh, the closing of the Muslim mind is available in Arabic, and the translation was made at the insistence of some Arab Muslim intellectual reformers who said, we need this book in Arabic. So it was done at their request. Uh, there are people who are seeking this reopening. The problem is they don't have a lot of institutional support in the Arab Muslim world. There are other parts of the Muslim world where, where there is a greater uh, reopening, and that particularly is in Indonesia. The largest Muslim organization, Adlatul Ulama, not Latul Ulama, is in Indonesia. And um, this organization is a sponsor of, I don't know whether you'd want to call it an enlightened Islam, but an Islam that is open to reason, that is seeking this restoration, that is not, um, does not think itself inimical to philosophy, that recognizes the utter necessity of religious tolerance and mutual respect based on a universal human dignity. Now, I've, I've met with the leader of that organization and discussed certain things in the, in the Quran that militate against this. And he, he will simply say, frankly, yes, that's a problem. And we have to change our understanding of this. Now, the question arises, can, can an influence uh, from such a group as Nadlatul Ulama have, have an influence back in the Arabic world? And the answer is it's unlikely. Uh, because obviously uh, the Arabic world is the origin of Islam. Muslims everywhere in the world, whether Indonesia or in India, pray in Arabic, even though most of them have no idea what they're saying. They don't speak Arabic, but they memorize the prayers and they say them. And of course, Muslims have Arabic names. Why is all this? It's because God speaks Arabic. Their understanding of the Quran is this direct revelation from Allah 
through Gabriel to Muhammad, uh, and that it that God speaks Arabic. Well, let's contrast that with Christianity. Primacy. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, like here you have Christ. Now we believe him to be God. He's God. He resurrected from the dead. He could have forced his hand on humanity, but he chose not to. He allows us to choose. And frankly, that's how love works. God is love. I mean, God allows us to choose, yet he is in control. I mean, I just, I can't understand how you could think that you're going to force somebody to do something when their will is not with you. They may go along due to the fact that you may take their life or you may kill their family, but their heart isn't in it. You don't have them. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I just can't understand the premise of, the, of that faith. Because you can't force someone to love you. Yeah, well, I mean, love is not part of the theological conception of Allah, because um, love denotes a lack in the lover. And they say Allah, the omnipotent Allah, lacks nothing. So he may favor someone, but he doesn't love them. He may be all compassionate and all merciful, which every one of the surahs in the Quran, except one, begins with, Allah, the all compassionate, all merciful, but he may favor those who obey him or he may not. It's entirely up to his caprice. Um, now, there is a mystical side to Islam called Sufism, where you have beautiful, beautiful meditations on God's love. Uh, but that, that was influenced heavily by the, the Christian mysticism of the the desert monks in the middle east and it's not favorably looked upon by orthodox sunni islam so i mean joe the the tendency is always to blow over these differences as if they can't be and it's not so and we're all this way or all that but we're not you have to understand islam from within itself and it's not all the same thing it's not homogeneous there are possibilities most particularly in South Asia and in Indonesia, as I mentioned. Um, but there, there, you know, there, there are, I've, I've worked with these Muslim reformers for some time. I'm associated with organizations that do this, but it's a long, hard road to travel and with little prospect of success, but it, you know, there's nothing else to do. Right. Except to try it. I think one way of going about it is America. I think the West, as we alluded to earlier, Robert Riley joining us to the front line with Joe and Joe, we should get back to rehellenization for perhaps we would attract, attract as we should as Catholics, because we are supposed to be evangelizing. If they started to see the West, particularly the Christian West, actually living by Christian ideals, protecting their children from the, all the evil that's out there. Maybe they would say, well, I, I guess they are actually living up to their faith. But we only have a few minutes left, Bob. I, I want to get into this real quick. You have said that the explosion of global communications has ex exacerbated this crisis. You said, quote, the hundreds of satellite TV channels are more or less rubbing their noses in the inferior material conditions of the Islamist, Islamic world and challenging their conception of Islamic worth. The Islamist revival is a direct reaction to this. Can you explain that, explain that to our audience, Bob, if you would? We have, probably have about four, four and a half minutes left. No, no, that's exactly it, Joe, that the explosion in satellite television springs into the living rooms of most people in the Muslim world the West, whether they want it or not. And though the degeneracy is there, uh, one thing that is very clear for all to see is the enormous wealth. Now, Islam is a religion of success. In other words, Allah promises success to those who follow his path. Now, how is it that this infidel West uh, has such material superiority to Muslims. Well, how, how, and, and you see how that would aggravate them when they they're constantly have pushed in their face the enormous wealth of the West and their own poverty 
it incites them. And they have to think that either they're not following the path of Allah, and that's why they're not enjoying the success. And therefore, they have to return to the path of Allah. And when was uh, Islam at its most successful? Well, in its early centuries. So there you see this, you know, Islam's end is its beginning, that we have to go back to the time of Muhammad. We have to replicate and uh, imitate everything the, the prophet did. And we have to live as they lived in Medina and Mecca. And this inspires the Islamists and the Osama bin Ladens and li leads to this crazy uh, modern version of uh, jihad that has caused such destruction in our world since 9-11. Mm. So that's a direct product of this kind of thing. When, when you know, the East was East and the West was West, people were fairly content to live in their traditional ways without a tremendous amount of discontent because they, they didn't know much outside their own community. And now they're only, the only thing they have in which to retreat is their faith. And so that's what they're doing. And they're, but they're taking the, the, a version of their faith that helps them to understand this dysfunctional situation into which they've fallen. Now, the way we would try to reason our way out of that, they, they, their tendency is not to do that, that it's a matter right. of a more pious practice of their faith. Joe Rasinello, you were going to say we have about I was a minute left, Joe. Do you think like you take a person like Osama bin Laden, who clearly capitalized on some of these folks who were downtrodden and promised them things? Um, do you think because their life is the way it was that they were so quick to follow along and commit these atrocities and commit them to this day? Bob, we have about 60 seconds, Bob. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the Osama bin Laden's and many of these uh, terrorists are amongst the most wealthy and the, the, better, the better educated. So they're not reacting in this way because they're personally poor. They're reacting that way because they're incited by this most radical teaching, which has always been present there in Islam. Robert Riley, the, the title of the book is The Closing of the Muslim Mind, How Intellectual Suicide Created the Modern Islamist Crisis. Where can people buy the book, Bob? Well, just about any online seller. You should be able to find it at Barnes & Noble or that other company that we don't know. That, <laughs> that other company. Is it available? Who's the publisher, Bob? Well, it's Intercollegiate Studies Institute, but I, okay. it's usually the University of Chicago Press that distributes it. But uh, it just uh, Google it and it'll pop up on some Like online. everything else in the modern world, yes, just Google it. Go. Robert R. Riley, thank you, as always, for joining us at the front line with Joe and Joe. Joe, I know I could speak for him uh, and also myself. We have been educated today, uh, so we want to thank you for that. We want to thank you all out there for joining us at the front line on the Veritas Catholic Radio Network, 1350 on your AM dial, 103.9 on your FM dial, spreading the truth of the Catholic faith to the New York City metropolitan area. Please be sure to download the Veritas Catholic Radio Network mobile app so that you can have access to all of our station's content and follow Joe and I on social media, particularly on YouTube at the Frontline TV. The Frontline TV, like, subscribe, share, do all that fun stuff. And remember until the next time that our conversation is your conversation and that conversation is going on everywhere.